Well, if that which is most familiar to me can generate something completely unrecognizable to me, to call it the self is to betray the notion of the self. So what I've called it over the years from the very, very beginning, I can't even remember how long ago we incorporated this nomenclature, is I called it the other. And, you know, the, the German historian of religion, Rudolf Otto, defined God as the holy other, the holy and totally other, he said. This is somewhat like Nicholas Cusanus's theology of the late uh, uh, of the fourteenth century, where he said God can only be defined by s negative statements. God is not this. God is not that. Uh, uh, the wholly other, and the experience of DMT seems to be that. And I don't know if it's just that we are neurologically set up, that there's a button in us, the equivalent of a reset button that just clears all the registers, and that's why it's wholly other. It's wholly other because you just dumped your entire memory load off your disk, and you're now looking at a clean disk for the first time in your life, and you don't have the faintest idea what it could possibly be. It's something like that. Language fails. Anticipation fails uh, and naturally because we have this sort of metaphysical openness in our ideological systems we identify this wholly otherness with God with the transcendent force in our lives and so it seems to be can you remember some things that it said <laughs> <laughs> can I remember some things or, that it said well, first of all, yes, this idea of an other that you can relate to. It's interesting, it's fascinating how if you really go to bedrock with these things, there's some really interesting Christian theology that relates to all this. Uh, you know, the, the existential theology of, Aaron, uh, of Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard said the defining relationship in life is an I-thou relationship to Christ. And the I-thou relationship, and Martin Buber made a great deal of this as well. So it's, it's a profound thing to relate to an other, even if that other is uh, an other human being. It's still, you know, an abyss of ambiguity. I don't know who you are, where you came from, what your agenda is, what your plans are for me, whether they're casual or intense, and so forth and so on. So then, meeting an other that is not a human being, that is somebody who sits up in your mind and says, Hey, big boy, <laughs> what's cooking? Uh, is... Uh, it, it, it opens up the possibility for a relationship and it can be explored. And I always thought, you know, that you could somehow trap it, that it was sort of like a game in a fairy tale, that if you were clever enough, you could an, ask a series of questions where you would then have trapped it into revealing, aha, so you are my amygdala, <coughs> uh, so forth and so on, this kind of thing. I have never, in the presence of the thing, been able to do that. Uh, as far as what it has said, uh, basically it's told me everything I know. As far as boiling it down to the aphoristic level, uh, you've heard these all through the years. Uh, uh, well, you know, death by astonishment. All the best lines come uh, from the thing itself. I mean, my talent seems to be that I'm able to relax and allow this very ingratiating logos to take over. It's a kind of low-key demonic possession in the, from the point of view of my critics uh, to speak about this other way of, of looking at things. In terms of what it has said to me, it's this revelation about the nature of time. And it's a puzzling revelation because uh, it's mathematical, it's formal, 
it will either be proven spectacularly true or spectacularly false. There is no escaping this incredible definitive test built into it. It's not something I would ever have thought up. Uh, and uh, it's just something I was given. And I was sort of at a dead end. I mean, I was a good person to give it to. I didn't really have a job uh, in life. And I, I, it's like a talisman or a key. Uh, you know, you meet people who are into astrology, and for them, it opens up all doorways. Everything can be explained, and I'm not belittling it. I'm making an example of it. Um, when you were talking about the Holy Other, right. you were talking about entity and messages. One of the things that happened to me in my early experiences with EMT was that I was totally in awe. I was flabbergasted. And until I stopped being flabbergasted and paid attention, I didn't get that they were signaling me to do something. Oh, yeah. You know, they wanted me to participate in, in what was happening rather than just sit there and go, wow, isn't this incredible? No, they say to you, or they say to me, do not abandon yourself to amazement. You know, don't give way to astonishment. I mean, try to hold it together, fella. Which is a strange thing to be being told by an alien entity inside a hallucinogenic flash. It's not encouraging you to let it all go. It's saying, you know, pay attention. And then, in my case, what they're trying to do is they can make things out of sound. Or their words are three-dimensional modalities. They're operating in a linguistic domain where words are sculptural entities made of light. And they're singing objects into existence, which are like puns or mathematical formula or small machines that are cycling through various kinds of changes. And they're singing this stuff into existence and insisting that you attempt to do the same, you know. And, you know, this is so startling because you have to understand these trips only last three to five minutes. So there's not a lot of time to get used to this. I mean, there you are sitting in a room with your friends talking about consciousness exploration or whatever rhetoric you use to get yourself to the edge of these things. You fire up the pipe, you take one enormous hit, and the next thing you know you know, you're surrounded by screaming elves, by the hundreds that are speaking in this alien language that is causing objects to hang in the air and ricochet off the walls. And these things come, you know, it's a scene of wild confusion. It's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon running backwards. And these things come bounding up and they say, look at this. And out of the air, out of their guts, out of nowhere, they pull objects which are the most astonishing things you can imagine. Literally the most astonishing things you can imagine. Jeweled, filigreed, machined, turning things. And you look at it and you say, my God, you know, anybody in my, uh, from my planet looking at this would not have to be told what this is. This is an alien artifact. And you're looking at it, and they say, forget that. Look at this one. And then here's another one. And they're tossing them up. And meanwhile, the objects themselves are able to sing other objects into existence. And there is this aura. The word zany comes to mind. It's like a Max Sennett comedy or a Marx Brothers cartoon. I mean, uh, it's, it's a land of explosions and falling anvils and surprises are popping out of everywhere. And you're just trying to hang on. You say, you know, now we're at, uh, you know, we're a minute and a half into it at this point. And this intense effort to communicate something. And, you know, we have talked in the past, we can talk now if you want, about Celtic fairyland and tradition, worldwide tradition of gnomes and elves. And, but when you're there, it doesn't look like that. 
It's much more pointed ears, shining eye, strange machine. It's much more off-planet. I mean, we're not seeing leather jerkins and, and pointed-toed little boots and uh, uh, the plucking of fairy harps. It's not quite like that. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah? What about children who seem to experience the phenomena that you're talking about, these people who come into their bedrooms in, in the middle of the night and communicate with them? Um, children who aren't, I mean... Well, I think this is where the abduction thing is coming from, that, that I don't know what these entities are. I don't... Th when you burst into the DMT place there is an incredible sense of place. And yet, the things that you're witnessing, matter is not capable of any matter. I mean, aliens can be one thing. They can have tentacles. They can do this and that and the other thing. But, but when there's no defined form, then you say, you know, you are like an idea, I say to the entity. You are like an idea. You have no defined form. You're continuously amorphous. And, you know, it then replies, yes, I am who I am, or something like that. It's the face of the abyss. I mean, I've had conversations with it where I've, after, you know, a more zany episode where you then begin to feel a little confidence with it. And then you say, well, show me what you are for yourself. What are you really? I can tell that you're coming to me through a series of filters and presentations and masks. What are you really? And it's like the temperature falls 10 degrees in the room and a black curtain begins to rise and there's an organ note like that thing in the Bach B minor mass. And after about 15 seconds, you just say, you know, call it off. <laughs> I'm not ready for it. Let's go back to the little fuzzy bunnies and the alien invasion scenario. But I'm, I'm not ready. And then it like, it, it's very obliging. It says, okay, you know, you asked for it. Uh, but so there is the sense, you know, of what is this? I don't know. I think that, the ma that this is the most important fact about our situation on this planet. And it's discovered over and over again over the past 100,000 years that there's somebody else, something else, somewhere else here. And anybody who says they understand it is bullshitting. The theosophists don't understand it, the Catholics, the Kabbalists, nobody understands it. But it is real. And I don't know what it means to find this out. Uh, you see, the amazing thing about psychedelics is it's not, it doesn't depend on a state of grace. It doesn't depend on allegiance to a leader. It doesn't even depend on a special diet or theological predilection. The astonishing news about these psychedelic experiences is you don't have to go to India for 10 years. You don't have to be chosen by Babaji. This works for most people and would probably work for you. And if you think the world has no surprises, if you think that you've got it all figured out and you haven't ever had an intense boundary dissolving psychedelic, then you're absolutely out to lunch. You don't know what's going on. It's like the opinions of 11 year old boys about sexuality. You know, <laughs> what do they know that they should hold such opinions? And, uh, you know, sexuality provides a good metaphor. We cannot forestall our sexuality. You know, eventually the roar of hormones through the bloodstream pushes most people over the edge, some sooner than others. Uh, this p capacity for the psychedelic experience, which is built into our soma, our body, as well, you can actually go from birth to the grave and never experience it if you are sufficiently sold out to a sufficiently idiotic culture, then it's possible to evade this 
experience of maturation. It's like having a Mercedes and there's a certain button on the dashboard and you never pushed it. <laughs> you don't know, you know, what it did. Uh, because, and yet it's as profound as sexuality, it's as profound as the forming of relationships, the birthing of children, uh, birth, death. This is the thing. And many, many religions have come to the conclusion that life somehow needs to be a preparation for a passing on to some other place. And the metaphor of light vehicle is used in many different traditions. And I think that you, there is some truth to the notion that uh, the reason we are alive is to learn the path out of the labyrinth and that shamanism is a rehearsal for death. All this talk about hyperspace and other dimensions and eternity, you know, what we're really talking about here is the cultural and personal enterprise of leaving the body behind. Can I just start talking about abductions and children and never really oh, yeah. got back to that? Let me, close, let me do that. Well, it's simply that we share this planet with some other kind of entity and culture is a way of sealing us off from this fact which children are not fully acculturated children are barbarians of some sort and then as they become acculturated their invisible companions fade away and they become as dreary as uh, as the rest of us the abduction phenomenon i think is simply an inability to tell the difference between uh, dream and memory. Dream is the fascinating dimension, and I don't demean these experiences by associating them with dream. I think that probably when we fully understand DMT, we will realize that uh, every night in deep sleep, most people go to the meltdown place and actually experience a DMT trip. But the essence of the core of the DMT trip is you cannot remember it. A really good DMT trip has a part always in the center where you do not lose consciousness. You are conscious while it's happening, but you can never ever talk about that part of the trip because within 20 seconds of its ceasing to be the present it's it's gone it lays down no memory trace and that's the moment where you really find out what's going on they show you you know you get the hyper masonic initiation of the local galactarian lodge <laughs> at that point but then you you come out of it and you have no trace of it. You have the sense of having been in the presence of the pleroma, but what that means, you haven't the faintest notion. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm curious about common elements uh, from person to person that are repeatable in some way about in, in a particular trip. For example, you've talked a lot in past lectures about and your experience with these self-replicating machine elves. Right. And, um, I've never met them myself uh, under DMT. I go to a vast crystal cave, but uh, there are some experiences that repeat with mushrooms for me, like a crystal ball coming down from the left, and if I can tune it in just right, I pass into another dimension. I'm wondering if you have, uh, uh, in speaking to lots of people, found common elements that, are, that, that show up in entities or whatever. Well, my, uh, yeah, I, my approach to that was, is sort of Jungian, and I've talked to a lot of people who've done DMT and tried to build up a composite image of what is happening. And a great deal, it has a lot to do with what you bring to it, your past education and experience, obviously, and it has a great deal to do with just your descriptive powers and your ability to stay calm. I mean, some people just go nuts and yell for it to end and carry on uh, from talking to a lot of people the archetype that rules DMT I would say is the archetype of the circus and uh, think for a moment uh, the circus is about 
a, a, a focus on a well-lit central area filled with chaotic activity. First of all, the clowns. And the clowns are the self-transforming machine nails. They arrive in their tiny car and 15 of them get out and they have big noses and rubber shoes and they dance around. Clowns. But in the DMT thing, there is a weird and very strong erotic component. And I believe from my own work on myself that I became aware of Eros. I wouldn't say had my first erection, but maybe the first one I was ever conscious of or something like that, in the presence of an, a lady acrobat at a circus wearing a tiny spangled costume and hanging by her teeth way up in the... And I got it death and eros and this incredible dynamic so you have the clowns the the death and eros thing at the circus and then you have um this kinky undercurrent which is the sideshows you know the rat-faced boy and the thing in the bottle and the two-headed lady and all that it just just off the main ring, folks, the hoochie-coochie dancers and all that. And then, when you think about the concept of the circus generally, you realize it's a perfect metaphor for DMT because I grew up in a small town in Colorado where every 1st of July, the carnival would come to town. And we were told we couldn't stay out after 9.30 at night playing when the carnival was in town because these carny people, they were just a different stripe, you know. Uh, some of them probably drank heavy. Uh, they were of racially questionable origins and so forth. And they brought immense excitement to this little town unpacked their wonders, built their Ferris wheels and rides, bilked all the rubes of their cash, and packed it all up and went away. And of course, every kid worth his salt wants to run off with the circus. And, you know, Ray Bradbury in his book, The Circus of Dr. Lau, used these motifs. Fellini in his films, over and over again, the circus <laughs> is a motif for the unconscious. So over time, and I've had people say, you know, very interesting things. I saw a woman do a subthreshold trip on DMT and unprompted and never having heard this rap, when she came down, she said, uh, it was the saddest carnival I've ever been to. She said, all the rides were closed and there were just those little square ice cream papers blowing in the wind and getting caught up and I was the only person there. Well, that's about as down a DMT trip as you can have and basically as you do more of it, you just dial it up until you know it becomes Barnum and Bailey Ringley Brothers and then it goes on to become the Star Wars bar and then it goes on to become something from which English cannot even uh, begin to wrap itself around. But I think that's the archetype.